Hello, namaste. Welcome. I'm Ariana Pachati. In this video, we are going to be discovering and understanding the eight limbs of yoga, as well as consciousness. And we're going to dabble in on the three states, as well as the fourth state of consciousness. But first, we're going to begin with the eight limbs of yoga. And we're going to be studying directly out of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. This one is um, translated by Sri Swami Satchidananda. It's the most popular one taught in North America. If you've never heard of the Yoga Sutras, no worries. Just allow yourself to remain open and to listen and absorb the information or absorb what stands out to you. So I'm going to begin in book two, if you are familiar with the sutras, book two, portion on practice, and I'm going to start with sutra 28, as this is the beginning portion of it diving deep into the eight limbs. Verse 28, by the practice of the limbs of yoga, the impurities dwindle away and there dawns the light of wisdom leading to discriminative discernment. Verse 29. The eight limbs of yoga are yama, which is abstinence, niyama, which is observance, asana, which is posture, practice, pranayama, breath control, sense withdraw is number five. Number six is dharana concentration number seven is dhyana meditation and number eight is samadhi contemplation so all eight of these limbs are equal to each other there is no limb that is greater or more important than the other limb so we have yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara dharana dhyana samadhi and by the way, where I'm at right now, I just woke up. It's 5.30. So my voice is a little sleepy and everything's a little bit sleepy. Sutra number 30. Now it's diving into each yama or each limb. In the first two limbs, yama and niyama, they both have five parts. So those two are going to be the longest to really discuss at first. So yama consists of non-violence, truthfulness, non-stealing, continence, and non-greed. So yama has those five parts, non-violence, truthfulness, non-stealing, continence, and non-greed. These great vows are universal, not limited by class, place, time, or circumstance. Niyama, again, this one also consists of five, and that's purity, contentment, accepting but not causing pain, study of spiritual books, and then worship of God or or self-surrender. When disturbed by negative thoughts, opposite ones should be thought of. When negative thoughts such as violence, etc., are done, caused to be done, or even approved of, whether incited by greed or anger, infatuation, whether indulged in with mild, medium, or extreme intensity, they are based on ignorance and they bring certain pain. Reflecting on that. In the presence of one firmly established in nonviolence, all hostilities cease. To one established in truthfulness, actions and their results become subservient. To one established in non-stealing, all wealth comes. By one established in continence, vigor is gained. Figure meaning strength or vital power. When non-greed is confirmed, a thorough illumination of the how and whys of one's birth comes. 
So this is why we practice the yama and the niyamas as it dives into each one. By purification arises disgust for one's own body and for contact with other bodies. Whoa, what is that one about? Okay, let's go deeper into that. When saucha, when you practice saucha, purity, when it's observed, it makes you feel that even your own body is impure. Every minute there are secretions. Impurities are eliminated. The breath pours out carbon dioxide. The skin discharges perspiration. If we really think about it, it seems to be a very dirty place in which we live. No matter how much perf- perfume we put on, it only hides the dirt. If our perspiration is foul, we spray on some deodorant. If our skin looks dirty, we dab on a little white powder to hide it. Every time we cover the dirt, it comes back. When we realize this, we develop an indifference towards the body. Not that we neglect it, but we no longer adore it. When we feel our bodies are the embodiment of dirt, how can we be attracted to other bodies these attractions will also get reduced and will certainly save us a great deal of trouble when we spend more time on deeper things than the body and eventually go into spiritual matters realizing we are the true self and not the body at all we will not be interested in bringing two bodies together anymore we will just think of this process as two cloths rubbing together because there is no difference between the body and a cloth. One is skin shirt, the other cotton shirt. The real union is not the union of two bodies. What is it we call masculine and feminine bodies? They are different shapes of flesh. By putting two lumps of flesh together, we can obtain nirvana. No, not at all. Excuse me. Spiritual union does not necessarily mean physical union. People misinterpret Tantra Yoga as something to do with sexual union. The Tibetan Tantric system speaks of Shiva and Shakti. Shiva being masculine aspect and Shakti being the feminine. This doesn't refer to physical forms, but to the positive and negative forces within each individual. Hatha yogis call it the sun and the moon. Ha meaning the sun, tha meaning the moon. The inner sun is your solar plexus. The moon is at the base of your spine. In order to become united, they must come together. Once we have purity of mind, no doubt someone will come to tell us what the true meaning of these things are, and what is to be done. When the, dis- when the disciple is ready, the guru comes, is a well-known Hindu saying. When the receiver is well-tuned, the music comes. We need not send out invitations. All that is necessary is for us to tune ourselves. Then without a second delay, the guru will come in some form. We are not ready though. Even with a hundred gurus around, we won't be benefited for a guru can't force anything into us. We must be ready to receive. Similarly, the music is within the radio, but the radio cannot force the speaker to vibrate and bring it out. This is why preparation, developing virtues like yama and niyama, very important. Moreover, one gains purity of sattva, cheerfulness of mind, one-pointedness, mastery over the, sen- over the senses, and fitness for self-realization. Even if we practice purity for just one day, we will really enjoy the benefit. By contentment, supreme joy is gained. So now we're moving on to the other sutras. By austerity, impurities of body and senses are destroyed and occult powers gained. By study of spiritual books comes communion with one's chosen deity. So they're talking about svadhyaya here. 
spiritual studies. It can be your own study as well. By total surrender to God, samadhi is attained. Sutra 46, asana is a steady, comfortable posture. Asana means the posture that brings comfort and steadiness. And each sutra has a, you know, almost every sutra has a long description of diving deep into it by, by Sri Swami Satchidananda. And it just, it goes deeper into the idea. By lessening the natural tendency for restlessness and by meditating on the infinite, posture is mastered. Therefore, one is not disturbed by the dualities, right? Dualities, neither heat nor cold, praise nor censor, profit nor loss will affect you. You are neutral. That being acquired, the movements of inhalation and exhalation should be controlled. This is pranayama. So now we're on the fourth limb of yoga, pranayama. I told you that niyama and yama and niyama would take the longest. The modifications of the life breath are either external, internal, or stationary. They are to they are to be regulated by space, time, and number, and are either long or short. <clears throat> There is a fourth kind of pranayama that occurs during concentration on an internal or external object. And its result, the veil over the inner light is destroyed. And the mind becomes fit for concentration. Have you ever tried to step into a meditation practice and the mind is just not staying in, in a concentrated state? And it becomes very frustrating. So not that one limb is more important than the other, but as a brand new beginner and as a human being living in this world where I understand linear teachings, right? Even though we are not, our minds are not linear. It can be helpful to start with the first four, five limbs of yoga, and then move on to the last three limbs of yoga. When the senses withdraw themselves from the objects and imitate, as it were, the nature of the mind stuff is pratyahara. So now that's talking about the next limb of yoga, pratyahara, which is withdraw from the senses. It's its own practice, right? you can withdraw from the senses. Um, And then what's the mind doing? You know, is the mind focused? Is the mind in a meditative state? There's stages throughout the meditative process. Am I in meditation now? No. You know, maybe we're we're withdrawing of the senses. Maybe we are in um, the stage right before, which is what we're about to go over right now. Then follows supreme mastery over the senses. So we're going into book three, and this talks about the next limbs of yoga, um, the last three limbs of yoga in more depth. And if these three feel confusing at all, please focus on the first five. So dharana, the next limb, is the binding of the mind to one place object or idea. So in other words, you're training the mind. Dhyana is the continuous flow of cognition towards that object. There is no meaning in meditation and space is also is lost. Time has no meaning in meditation and space is also lost. You don't know where you are. If you break that meditation, all of a sudden you may wonder what happened to my body. Even the body is forgotten in real meditation. You are above time and space and you are out of the body. When I say out of the body, don't think I mean that you are traveling in space or anything. I mean the mind transcends body consciousness. 
I experienced this on a very deep level. The first time I experienced this, I was pregnant with Dimitri, with my son, who's now five, five and a half. <clears throat> and I was in a sound healing class, and it was... 90 minutes long. The class was 90 minutes long. I fell into this deep meditative state, exactly what they're talking about there. Probably within the first 10 minutes. Definitely not within the first five minutes, but within, you know, maybe six to 10 minutes there in that six to 10 minute range. And I was in this place and I felt like, boom, you could have snapped your fingers and a second went by and I, and I, and and the class was over. Like time wasn't real. So it was like, oh, were you meditating? And I'm like, but there was no time. There was no time. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, I was there, but it didn't matter how long I was there for because time did not exist and it didn't affect me. And it was so interesting because I've also experienced life after death and it they're both very much, they're both kind of similar except, except when I died, it was way more vivid and way more extreme and it did feel like time had a little bit of an effect on where I was. It was like a transitional stage, but you were like transitioning through time. When I was in a meditative state, there was no end goal. Like I wasn't going anywhere. When I experienced life after death, I was in this dark space and then I saw this white light and then I naturally started to like move and levitate and and move into this light until I met and, you know, met with this light. And then shortly after that, I came back alive, came back to the body. So there was some type of end goal, like I was going somewhere But in this meditative state, I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't going anywhere. Space. Time didn't affect me. So where was I? I was so peaceful. When I came back, I felt like I had finally realized something. And I did not know what that something was. But it took me on this huge journey of discovering. <clears throat> so then going into the, the oh, looks like the last limb. Samadhi is the same meditation when there is the shining of the object alone as if devoid of form. So you will easily understand when you have little experience. Meditation culminates in the state of Samadhi. It's not that you practice samadhi. Nobody can consciously practice samadhi. Our effort is there only up to meditation. You put all your effort in dharana. It becomes effortless in dhyana, right? So you put your effort in dharana, concentration. The mind stays focused. It becomes effortless in meditation, in dhyana. And you are just there knowing that you're in meditation But in samadhi, you don't even know that. You are not there to know it because you are that. You think first with a lot of interpretations that is dharana. Then when you become what you think that is samadhi. In meditation, you have three things. The meditator, the meditation, and the object meditated upon. In samadhi, there is neither the object or the meditator. There is no feeling of I am meditating on that. There's like, there's no I am doing this. There is no that. To give a scientific analogy, if you keep on adding drops of an alkaline solution to an acid, at one point the solution becomes alkaline. At that point, you are simply adding alkali to alkali. There's no more acid there. The giver and the receiver become one. Earlier, the receiver was an acid head and the giver was alkali. As you add the alkali drop by drop and keep testing it with your litmus paper, at one point, all of a sudden you notice you are no longer an acid head. Who are you? 
the same alkali as God. You and God become one. That's samadhi. It's rather difficult to put into words. If you just keep working, you will know what samadhi is. Just like my experience, I did not walk into that class with that intention. I walked in because I was having anxiety and I was huge and I was pregnant and I felt uncomfortable and I was having back pain and I wanted to relax. And that was the only only class that was available for me that day. Of course, there are... It is difficult to put into words. Okay, yes, of course, there are different lower samadhis, as we talked about in the first book, where you attain the level and then come back. These are samadhis connected with form, idea, bliss, and pure ego. All these four still leave some parts of the mind with hidden desires. You are not completely free. The ideas in the mind are not completely roasted. They could still germinate again. That's why all these four are called Sabiha samadhi. Biha means seed. They are with seed. Don't think you are all clean and everything is okay. Everything is okay. It's okay. (laughs) As long as the seed is in the bag, it seems to be innocent. But the minute you take one seed out, dig a little hole, put it and pour a little water, then it comes up again. The sprouting tendency is still there. As long as you have that tendency, you are still in sabiha samadhi or savikalpa samadhi. But once you get completely roasted, even that germinating capacity goes away. The seeds are still there and all external appearance, they are the same. But even if they are to put, if the, even if they are put into holes in water, they won't germinate. What does this mean? All the thoughts and desires become selfless. Selflessness is the germ that sprouts saying, I want it. When the selfness, selfishness is completely taken out, you become germless. That is called Narbiha Samadhi or Nervikalpa Samadhi. One who has achieved this may look similar to anyone else, but the burnt nature of his or her mental seeds is the difference between ordinary people and liberated beings. They also eat, sleep, and do everything like everybody else. They may be doing anything, but they are not affected by what they do. There is no moisture of attachment to cause sprouting. They are living, liberated people. Liberation is not something you experience when you die. While living, you should be liberated. This is the final state of samadhi. It is not sitting sitting stiffly with eyes closed, as some people think. If sitting like a statue is what you call samadhi, All the rocks in the garden must be in deep samadhi. No, you will be useful. You will be active, more active than other people. Your actions are more perfect than other people's. You are dynamic, but you look static. Opposites meet, extremes look alike. A top that is not rotating is motionless. The same top at its highest velocity also looks motionless. Lack of light is darkness. Keep on increasing the light You get blinded by the light and feel you are in darkness again. A totally sattvic person appears to be very quiet. A totally tamasic one is also quiet. That is something to think about. The practice of these three, the last three, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi, upon one object is called samyamya. Samyamya. By the mastery of samyama comes the light of knowledge. Its practice is to be accomplished in stages. The last three limbs are more internal than the first five limbs. Even these three are external to the seedless samadhi. The The impressions which normally arise are made to disappear by the appearance of oppressive efforts, which in turn create new mental modifications. The moment of conjunction of mind and new mod- mental modifications is Niroda Parinamaha. The flow of Niroda, Niroda, oh my goodness, it's getting hard for me to read now. The flow of Niroda, Niroda Parinamaha becomes steady through habit. We're almost done. That is actually where we're going to stop there because we're going into other practices. 
and I don't want to go into other practices. I want to stay focused on just the eight limbs. Yeah, we're going into the friendliness. Okay, so just focusing on just the eight limbs. If you're a brand new beginner, focus on the first five. Focus on the first one, just yama and the five parts of yama. And then you go on to niyama and the five parts of niyama while at the same time still practicing the five parts that you learned from yama. Once you've understood those two, you keep practicing those two while you practice asana. Maybe you study deeper into asana. Maybe you actually get up and start practicing daily with the sun, with the sunrise and sun salutations. And then maybe from there you add in pranayama. And then once you feel like you have this good, deep foundational understanding of those, then you start to practice pratyahara and the sense withdraw. And then you dive into the last three limbs. So here are some good questions to really ask yourself on on the eight limbs of yoga. Um, I will post these under the video so that I'm not going into every single one. I'll just post them and you, I wanna, want you to take some time in a you know, journal entry fashion and just write about them. If you're just gonna practice you know, one at a time, that's fine. If you wanna study all of them, that's fine. But this is just for yama and niyama reflection questions. And now I want to talk a little bit about consciousness. Um, And we're not going to go too deep into consciousness, but just so people have a little understanding, I also have this other spiritual book called Living Enlightenment, the Gospel of Paramahamsa Nithyananda. And on page 414, it talks about living life with full intensity, with like pretty much full concentration and then full intensity. Like you live very intensely. Everything you do, you do it with like full awareness. And if that becomes very intense, that becomes very driving force, manifestation energy. It says intensity and the four states of consciousness. There are four states of consciousness. When you have I consciousness and thoughts, you're in the waking state. The state that you're in right now. In this state, I has more frequency than your thoughts. So you can control your thoughts. When you are without I consciousness, but having thoughts, you are in the dream state. In the dream state, your thoughts are at a higher frequency than your I consciousness. That's why when you have thoughts in your dreams, but you are not able to control them. When you are without I consciousness and you're not having any thoughts, you are in the deep sleep state. Normally, we are aware of only these three states of waking, dream, and deep sleep. The fourth state is where you have I consciousness, but no thoughts or turaya or turya. And I'm going to pull out the OM symbol. I'm sure you've seen the OM symbol before. So down here on the OM symbol, and it might be backwards depending on, I'm not sure how I'm holding this up. I might show backwards, I'm not sure. But see this bottom portion right here where it's labeled number one? That's the waking state. That represents the waking state. So the OM symbol itself represents the states of consciousness, but it also is a frequency, is a vibration. The sound to this is Aum, A-U-M, Aum. People meditate on that, on that sound, on that frequency. The, The symbol itself also emits a vibration, a frequency of Aum. So I have it tattooed on my leg and people will get various symbols tattooed on them or have them around their home or use them as visual meditations, etc. So now when we look at this, we can understand we see us in this. So then, oops, sorry. And then right over here where it's labeled number two, 
where usually you'll see this connected. It'll look like a number three, and then it looks like it has a tail that's connected, that number two. That's the dreaming state. The top of this, at the top of the, you know, it looks like a number three. The top of that, that's the deep sleep. So we've got the deep sleep, the dreaming, and the waking. And then Turiya, or some people call it Turiya, but it's really, I think it's really pronounced Turiya based on the Sanskrit class I'm in, I'm pretty sure it's called Turiya. Turiya is a, is they say the fourth state of consciousness. And that's up here where the diamond is. And then the world of illusions, Maya. Maya means illusion. That veils true awareness. The illusion is what's, is kind of like the separation right here. So intense seeking awareness in the three states. So intensity means being intense in every moment and whatever you do. So first you need to be aware of yourself in all states. Then you can be intense throughout. Now you experience who you are with awareness only during the waking state. You feel, I am a doctor, I am a lawyer, I am an engineer, and so on. Only if we are aware of the identities that we carry and enjoy in all three states, we have caught the thread, the center line of all three states of waking, dream, and sleep. Then we catch the thread of all these three states. Did I already say that? Suddenly we realize our identity in all the three states. Somebody asked me, I don't think that in the deep sleep state I am aware then who is the person who comes back and says, it was such a deep sleep during my deep, it was a deep peace during my deep sleep. I was so, oh, I was in such a deep sleep. I was so peaceful. Who says that? Who is the person who is reminiscing about it, saying it was filled with darkness. It was as if I was not there at all. Who is coming back and remembering even this idea? I was not there at all. If the person is not there in this state, then who is coming back to connect all these three states? No, we cannot say we were not there in the deep sleep state. We were there, but we were not aware of the identity that we had in that state. Understand a person who is aware of all these three states is conscious. If we are aware of the identity in all these three states, then we are conscious enough. Our seeking is intense enough to be answered. We are intense enough to be initiated and blessed. If we are not already aware in all these three states, if we have not experienced all these three states with the same identity, then naturally we need to know, intensify. We need to now intensify our seeking. An intense seeker will carry the identity about himself throughout all these three states. If even once or twice you have experienced your waking identity in the dream state, then you are intense. In the dream state, suddenly sometimes you remember that you are beyond the identity which you think you are in the dream state. I have seen, and again it's out of the book, I have seen seekers going through this experience in the dream state. They will be dreaming and suddenly they will identify themselves with their identity in the waking state. Then they will think about their dream state. Hey, this is too small. This is nothing. If you have had the experience of your waking state identity in your dream state, then you have the intensity. Your seeking is intense. So wake up. During a nightmare, a very wild dream, just one thought or one click such as, hey, this is a dream is enough. You will be awakened. You will be out of the dream in the same way, if you are intense in this dream you are living called the waking world, then one click is enough and you will be called out of the dream. If you think, no, I need some more technique, then you are not really going through a nightmare or an intense dream. You are just having some casual flow of thoughts. Sometimes in the dream state, you will be seeing without any clarity. There will be some casual black and white shows which will be going on. You will then neither feel like watching it nor feel like coming out of it. If you are in those kinds of dreams, then you're just wasting your time. If you are not really intense, you are going to be in these kinds of dreams. N neither will you go down or go up. Please do not be in that state. Understand if you are in such an in 
intermediate state, then this click will not happen. It will not be sharp, strong, swift. Just like you can get up from your sleep by just an intense desire to wake up at a particular time, you can also get up from the deep slumber that have you have been in for so millions of lives. If you have an intense total desire to wake up, you can wake up this moment. Kabir says so strongly and beautifully, when you look for him, you will find him instantly. There are people who say, what is there in our hands when God wants us to be awake? He will wake us up. It is our destiny. Understand, these are nothing but cunning tricks of the mind. God knocks every moment at the door of the prison you have built for yourself. If you don't open, what can be done? I always tell people God is a gentleman. He never interferes with your freedom. If you choose to remain asleep, he will simply wait till you wake up. He respects your freedom till you are bored and realize the futility of the fantasy world you are in. He will patiently wait. Look inside yourself and you can see that you are choosing to remain asleep in your fantasy world. Reality is knocking on the door every moment, but we choose to ignore it. We are so used to, used to our dream world, we don't want to wake up. So when the master tells you that reality is much more beautiful and real, and you still remain in the inertia of sleeping, you have to understand it is only you who can choose to come out of your long dream. It is your choice and your responsibility. Have you ever tried this simple experiment? Suppose you want to get up early in the morning at 4 a.m. Suppose you don't have an alarm. At night when you go to sleep, simply make a deep and intense will. I am going to wake up at 4 a.m. At 4 a.m., you will find that you are awake, your eyes are open, and sleep has just disappeared. Your body clock responds directly to the intensity and sincerity of the desire. If you are not sincere and deep down you think, I will try this as an experiment, it's okay if I don't get up also, then it will not happen. Be sincere and intense, and it will simply happen. In all the states, one factor is common. The one who goes through the states, or the seer. If you look a little deeper, you can see that in all three states of waking, dream, and deep sleep, you are trying to change reality as it exists. We are trying to change the scene happening every moment in our lives. You are the seer and the projector. Whether you believe it or not, accept it or not, you create your reality. When you try to change the events and world outside, you are trying to change the scene by jumping in front of the screen. To change the scene, you need to change the film being projected on the screen. When you realize the futility of all the three states and the futility of trying to change the scene in all three states, the whole attention will fall to the seer. Then the awakening will happen. If instead you think that there is some utility in all these three states, your attention will be on them. You will continue to be engaged in them and you will continue to try to alter the scene. There are some people who carry the same awareness even in the deep sleep state. For them, when they very under when they when they very understanding of these three states happen suddenly they will become back to the center to awaken themselves to the fourth state turya how do i get enlightened i want to really bad Question is a word, quest is a feeling, man is born as a quest, the rest of the existence cannot reflect the divine like man can. Man is like a mirror, he has the choice to face and reflect the divine or to turn away. Man can make a conscious choice, which is why he can grow. Man can choose to realize the divine through his human form, no other being in existence has this choice. If these words, how do I get enlightened, I want to, really bad and urgently, have come out, if this question has come out as a deep quest, then you don't need anything. Just boil. Let the whole being burn with this quest. That is enough. Nothing else needs to be done. Let this boiling be intense. Allow this boiling. Allow this burning. Allow this intensity. Allow this urgency. Let the urge become urgent. 
Let the question become your quest. Let it just eat your ego, eat your inner space. People ask me, have you been enlightened by the divine grace or by your effort or by your quest? I tell them, you're having the quest is the first sign that you are having the divine grace. Unless you have the divine grace, you will not have the quest. Understand, this quest or seeking is like a seed. It is like a seed feeling suffocated inside the shell. See, unless the life that is inside the seed feels suffocated inside the shell, it won't open up and become a tree. The moment the seed starts feeling that it should open up, the moment it starts feeling the seeking, the urgency, and the quest to open up and become the tree, it means that already the tree inside the seed has started expressing itself. If you have the feeling that you should get enlightened, the Buddha in you has opened his eyes. The Buddha in you has started waking up. All you need to do is open your eyes. Allow the seeking from morning till night. Let it boil. Let it create a deep dissatisfaction in you. Let every pore in your skin, every nerve in your body, every cell in you vibrate with that intensity. Let it swallow all of your depressions you may have in your life. In life, you may have so many other depressions and sufferings of not having so many things. Let all of those sufferings be swallowed by this one suffering. When the seeking is intense, it will remove the juice from your ego. The green grass becomes like a haystack. Just a match is enough to burn the whole haystack down. The ultimate can happen in a split second through a simple happening. So understand, let this seeking, let this quest you're saying, how to get enlightened, I want to real bad and urgently, let this seeking burn all other sufferings, all other depressions, all other desires, and all other concerns about life. Let it happen and suddenly you will see that the seeking suddenly disappears. It's not there. When the seeking disappears, you are enlightened. You have achieved what you are seeking. Let's end with that. So, seek intensely. Allow your life to be that quest and the desire for the quest. Practice the eight limbs of yoga and don't allow yourself to become too overwhelmed as there's so much to study, so much information out there. Take it one step at a time, one thing at a time, and then you can encompass everything like a circle. Thank you so much for listening. I wish you peace and joy. Have a wonderful day. Namaste.